Hey, good morning, good morning, Nathy Creek. Would you guys stand with us? Man, what a beautiful day. What a beautiful day to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth and get in the word a little bit. Father, we do bless you and we thank you, Lord, for just this time. We lift your name up in Jesus' name. All of you weak and wandering, all those who yet to find, come lay your burdens down. You'll take all of the chains you bring. All you thirst with no relief, all those with wells run dry, come to the richest spring. Quench your soul and satisfy. Let's sing this out. Come on, ye broken. Come on, ye broken. Come on, ye weary. Come lift your hands and together we sing. We are the sons and we are the daughters. We gather now to praise the Come on. 
It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough You did it for me, you did it for love It's your victory Because of your blood, my sins are washed away Now all of my life, I freely give Because of your love, because of your love I live Because of your love, I live is true it's because of the cross it's because of the love that was shown there that we can worship you freely and justly lord we thank you and as we dive into your word would you just show yourself to us and what you have for us lord we love you and in jesus name amen amen you guys can have a seat as we look at some video announcements Hey, Athey Creek, I'm Chris, and this is my wife, Amy, and we want to let you know what's going on around the church over the next couple weeks. First, we have Sunday night worship this weekend at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. So join us here in the building, or you can join us online. This is an hour-long service centered around worship, communion, and prayer. So if you are at home, make sure you grab your communion stuff before you start watching. Also, we are looking for people who are interested in becoming a volunteer to help out with our video production ministry. Uh, this is a ministry that, as you'd imagine, has grown a lot in the last year, and we're thankful for anybody that might be interested in, in helping out. So, you don't need to have a lot of experience. If you're interested or willing to do this, uh, check us out at the back table. You can also go onto the website to learn more. We want to hear from you. Lastly, ladies, we have two things coming up that I'm so excited about. First, it's our monthly Devoted Live is happening this Saturday, the 17th. We're going to get into the Word as we always do, but I'm also going to be joined this time by a panel of gals that are coming on to answer your questions. So if you have questions and you want to uh, send something our way, check out our social media post on that, or you can email us a question, and that will be 9 a.m. Saturday the 17th. We will always have caffeine and calories, so no worries there. The other event, guys, is brand new to us at Athey, and it's called the Renewed Conference. Gals, you will not want to miss this. This year, we're going to have Elisa Childers. She is a speaker. She is an apologist. She is a author, blogger. She has a book that just came out this last October. But she has a fantastic message for us gals and how to confront the lies of culture with a biblical worldview. So important for us. So the conference is going to be right here at Athey, June 25th and 26th. The signups are opening this weekend, and guys, this one's going to fill up. So head to the website, visit the back table for more info, but make sure you check out the Renewed Conference. All right, you guys are up to date. With that, grab your Bibles and let's get into the Word. All right, there it is. Hey, thanks for coming. Good to see you. Welcome to Athey Creek. And uh, man, we're all glad you're here. And did you guys have a good resurrection weekend last weekend? That was great. That was a good time. And um, man, there's a lot of folks here at this 10 o'clock service. Uh, uh, those of you that are here that were at other services last week, go back to that service. 
This is the one where it's you know, hard to park and hard to find room. Uh, and, hey, we're, uh, w- you know, we did six services last week and we went back to five and we know that that probably, that time is coming. So we're kind of working on more of a, uh, another plan to try to make more room. Uh, but, um, but right now, uh, the four o'clock Saturday service is still uh, got a, like three or four seats extra. So, so you might go to that one. Uh, I don't know, maybe the 12 o'clock uh, today would, would be good, but don't be afraid to shift around. This 10 o'clock service is the one that tends to get kind of packed more than the other ones a little bit. So just keeping that, trying to nudge you uh, in that direction uh, if you want. Uh, But anyway, good stuff. Let's get right to it. Why don't you grab your Bible and turn with me to Ezekiel chapter four. And uh, I'm gonna, uh, you know, be on Wednesday night studying uh, these chapters, four, five, maybe six. We got some work to do in Ezekiel. Um, Some people kind of look at Ezekiel as the weird book because it is quite mysterious and Ezekiel says kind of some weird stuff, but he also does some really weird things. Poor guy. It's not that he's a weirdo. It's that God says, listen, Ezekiel, nobody's gonna listen to your word, so I want you to give the people some object lessons. Um, and, uh, and some of these object lessons, poor Ezekiel, we're gonna see them on Wednesday night. He's gonna cut his hair and throw it in the air and slice it up with a sword. Um, <laughs> he's gonna cook some food with cow manure. He's gonna, um, he's gonna dig a hole in his house and sort of Shawshank Redemption, sort of tunnel under his house and out to the street. We're gonna see some crazy stuff that he does. Um, but I want to show you one of those things, um, these object lessons that's meant for the, the children of Israel, but I find really kind of exciting and important for us to know. So it's Ezekiel chapter four is where we'll pick it up. And we'll start in verse four, actually, Ezekiel 4.4. 4. It says in Ezekiel 4.4, 4, Lie thou not, uh, lie thou also uh, upon thy left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days, 390 days, so thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Man, tough gig being a prophet in the Old Testament. What has he gotta do? He's gotta go out in the street and lie down on his left side, and he's gotta lay on his left side for 390 days, that's over a year. Can you imagine that? I mean, I hope he has a sleep number or something that he can kind of you know, get comfortable because that's a lot of lying down for a long time. And then if that's not bad enough, um, then after he's done with his 390 days, he's supposed to add another 40 days, but he gets to flip over to his left side uh, and do that. Man, poor Ezekiel. And you say, what in the world is God trying to say with Ezekiel lying on his days? Well, see, the people of Israel weren't listening to anything that he was saying or Jeremiah or Daniel or any of the prophets for that matter, the, the Jews were stiff-necked as the Bible calls them. And so it would, it would happen that Ezekiel would be laying out there and they'd be walking away. There's Ezekiel still out there lying on his right side. How long have you been doing that? Well, 120 days. Well, how long are you gonna do that? Well, you just watch and see. And so every day they'd come out, he's still out there, another day. What does this mean, Ezekiel? And Ezekiel would say, every day that I'm laying on my side is another year Israel will be judged by God. Wow, that, that starts to hit, hit home a little bit. So this first time, right on the left side, 390 days equaling 390 years of judgment because of the rebellion of the Jews. And then to make it worse, 40 days for what you know, the men of Judah had done for their 40 you know, years that they owe God. So, so now you, you've got this strange thing, and I know it's still kind of early to do math, but we're gonna have to do that anyway. Uh, but you, know, you get this 390 plus 40, you, you've got you know, a long time of 430 years required of Israel because of their rebellion. 430 years? Now you say, what does this all mean and what's it all about? Well, as it turns out, let's look at a few other scriptures. Jeremiah 25, 11. 
Um, what does it say? It says, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Now, some of you that are, you know, Bible students, you say, Brett, I, I recognize this 70 years judgment. I mean, you know, we know. We know why Jeremiah says this in chapter 25. It's because the Jews, they owed God 70 years that God says, you're gonna be in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Now, for you real scholars, does anybody remember why the Lord required 70 years of captivity for the Jews? Anybody? The festival year? Well, the Sabbath year as it relates to the land. Remember the land? We read, read about this in 2 Chronicles, uh, right there in 36, 21. Um, the Lord defines why he required 70 years of captivity. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land has enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years. What's that all about? Well, long ago in Leviticus, the Lord said, listen, when you get to the promised land, in seven years, one of those seven years, you gotta set aside for the land to be fallow. Now, horticulturally, we all know now, scientifically, that that's actually good for the land to take a break once in a while, let the land sort of heal itself. But the Jews said, yeah, whatever we're gonna get ahead by not taking a break in one year of seven, and we're gonna just keep planting our crops. And they did this for 490 years. And they thought they could outsmart God, but God says, guess what? You owe me, you owe me those 70 years I asked you to. Now, by the way, it wasn't just about the land, I don't believe. It was about the heart of the Jews to be rebellious against God. And they said, we can get ahead. We can do it our own way. Forget God, and we're gonna farm the lands however we want. And the Lord says, guess what? You became a debtor to me. You owe me those 70 years. So again, most, most people that read their Bible say, yeah, we, we understand the captivity during the time of Jeremiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, the prophets, it would be 70 years in Babylon. That's kind of, you know, 101, you know, Old Testament uh, understanding. But, but Ezekiel, in this mysterious way, is now introducing a whole nother stretch of years that the Jews owe God because of their rebellion. And as it turns out, it's 430 years, not 70 years. Why did that happen? Why did during the time of the captivity, remember Ezekiel was in Babylon when he was prophesying and he was in the middle of the 70 years of captivity. Why did Ezekiel, by the, you know, the word of God, why did he extend it to not 70 years, but 430 years, why? Well, the reason is because the children of Israel never really repented. They kept in their attitude of rebellion and they, they said, yeah, whatever, we, we'll, we'll do our seven years and we'll continue to not walk with the Lord. See, here's what happened. Uh, in their captivity, um, the Jews, you know, taken from Jerusalem, which remember was crushed and totally destroyed. Um, in fact, we remembered that, reading about that in Jeremiah 38, remember that? Chapter 38, 17 and 18, the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, the walls were crushed, the city was crushed, and the Jews are now in Babylon and there's nothing back in Jerusalem, it's all destroyed. So picture yourself being a kid born of two Jewish parents in Babylon. Man, you're starting to talk like a Babylonian, walk like a Babylonian. Man, you, you're living. The Jews were starting to live comfortably in Babylon. They were assimilating to the Babylonian culture, as it turns out. Um, and, you know, they'd shop in Bridgeport of Babylon or whatever. They were just happy. You know, they were just totally happy. Now, now, when it came time for the Jews to go back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, most of the people said, yeah, whatever. We're Babylonians, oh, Babylon, you know, like they're, they're suddenly Babylonians. And, and, and it was a very tiny remnant of people that said, no, we're gonna go back to Israel like God told us to do. It was only around 50,000 people that came back out of much greater population of Jews. Most of the Jews stayed there in Babylon and they were lost. But even the 50,000 that came with Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, remember those stories? Um, even those guys that came back, they were kind of nice for about 10 minutes, but even after that, they started rebelling against the Lord. The Jews just kept rebelling and walking contrary to God. And so Ezekiel says, because of your rebellion, it's not gonna be just 70 years. You're gonna still be in the judgment. You might even call it sort of a curse. You're, you're gonna be, as a people, as a nation, you're gonna be messed up 
for a lot longer than 70 years. He, he said, nope, Ezekiel said 430 years. Now this is where this gets kind of interesting because you know, as a Bible prophecy buff, as a Bible literalist, I take the Bible literally, it makes me start to wonder, okay, so Ezekiel's given some very specific numbers of years according to the days that he laid out there, 430 years. So it makes me kind of wonder, well, what if you go forward you know, from the day that, uh, of, of their 70 years? Now, now, remember, the 70 years of captivity, that's their first you know, payment of their debt, 70 years. And so um, you start to do the math uh, and you say, well, if they owed 70 years out of the you know, 430 years, that brings them to a remaining 360 years that they owe God. God says, because of your rebellion, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you go for another 360 years after your 70 years. Um, so, so this is where we start to do even more math. The full sentence of God you know, would be the 430 years owed, 70 years already paid, if you would, during the time of Daniel and Ezekiel. That leaves 360 years yet served. Are you guys still with me? Good. Because this is the only beginning. <laughs> um, now, uh, what does the Bible say? Uh, uh, now, this is interesting. Uh, before I get into this, um, you, you say, okay, Brett, that's, that's cool. So, so if, you know, 360 years are left. If you go from the end of the 70 year captivity, 360 forward, what happens? It seems like something big should happen, right? Because it's the end of the curse. And so if you go forward, it brings you to a date in Israel that is nothing. There's nothing that happened. Doesn't it seem like in this prophecy where Ezekiel's laying on his side for all this time saying, thus saith the Lord, you know, uh, 430 day, days equals 430 years. And if you fast forward, is the curse over? Shouldn't Israel suddenly be blessed and have another new chance and, and start to flourish and, and start to do well? But as it turns out, um, they were doing just as bad after those 430 years. And it just stayed being bad for a long time. So was Ezekiel wrong? Well, this baffled prophecy buffs and, and Bible scholars. Uh, what did this mean? And you know, if you go forward into 430 years, why don't we see any change? Israel still seems to be scattered and cursed and under the, the, the bummers of sin. What happened? Well, that's where I think the secret is unlocked in Leviticus chapter 26. Way back in Moses' time when he was given the law, um, the Lord said to the Jews, listen, and this is Leviticus 26, 29, if you walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. Fast forward a couple verses there in Leviticus 26, verses 23 and 24. If you will not be reformed by me, these things, uh, 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 by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then I will also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. Fast forward a couple more verses, Leviticus 26, 27, and 28. If you will not for all this hearken unto me, but will walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you also in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you or punish you seven times for your sins. Now, this is an interesting thing that the Bible uh, in, in Leviticus very clearly spells out. If you, in times of judgment, refuse to walk with me and, and continue in your rebellion, then I'm gonna multiply the, the curses upon you seven times. That's interesting. Now this is why I think this is somewhat of the key that might unlock Ezekiel's prediction and prophecy. Because check this out, I find this interesting. If you take those 360 years that are left after the 70 have been removed, and you apply the seven times curse of, of uh, you know, Leviticus 26, that means the Jews now owe, if, they, if that's true. Now, now the truth is they were in rebellion and walking contrary to God all those years. So the Levitical curse does apply, technically. So that brings you to them owing the Lord 2,520 years. That's a long time. Now, if you apply the 2,520 years, you have to be careful on this. And this is where it gets a little uh, sketchy and I can't even go into all the massive details, but here's a few things you should know if you're doing your math. Remember, like in our Daniel 9 prophecy we talked about on Palm Sunday, 
you gotta use the Jewish or the Babylonian calendar because um, they're a lunar calendar. We use more of a Gregorian calendar that doesn't, it's a year of 365 days. The Jews and the Babylonians at that time used the calendar of 360 days. It was a lunar calendar. So we have to kind of say those 2,520 years, we have to transform them into days because days makes it all equal no matter what calendar you're using. Are you guys with me on that? So you go to the different calendar and suddenly you have the 2,520 years predicted by both Ezekiel's prophecy and the Leviticus curse of seven times. And that takes that uh, 360 days per year. It brings you to 907,200 days. That's a long haul of the Jews being sort of under the burden of their own sin and the Lord saying, I'm chastening you, I'm, I'm punishing you for these 907,200 days. Um, now there's some dates that we actually know that are interesting and these are key dates I've been talking about and you might even say harping on for the past several months. Remember in Jeremiah, I was spending so much time talking about the three waves of besieging Jerusalem and the Babylonians and those three waves. There's a reason why I was harping on that because those dates are all significant and you bump into them all throughout the Bible. Um, do you remember when I was talking about the, the, the first wave of Babylonians invasion into Israel started in 605 BC and that first wave kind of went through 605 to 607. Do you guys remember when we talked about this? And the last wave of the three was 586 BC. These are dates that are very important if you're reading the Bible and studying the history of the Jews. But that date of 605 BC, that's when the first captivity uh, uh, started happening where Nebuchadnezzar came and carried Jews in 605 from Jerusalem into captivity there uh, in Babylon, 605 BC. Now, what you do is if you look at that, um, after the 70 years, so you got 605, the first Jews kept taken into captivity. You apply the 70 years of, of their captivity in Babylon, that brings you to July 23rd, 536 BC. Now that is a significant date, by the way. It's, it's, it's different than the date of Daniel. Remember Daniel, um, his thing in Daniel 9 was about the commandment to go restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That was a guy named Xerxes. And we talked about him in, on Palm Sunday. But Cyrus the Great, um, he was the one who gave that command to release the people to go home to Israel. And that was, as it turns out, July 23rd, 536 BC. That's kind of an interesting date. Cyrus releases the people. Okay, so if you do the math of all this, you got July 23rd, 536 BC, and then you add the 907,200 days, it brings you to the most interesting date in the future, that is May 14th, 1948. That's interesting. You're saying, it's not to me, what happened in May? Well, as it turns out, May 14th, 1948 is the very day Israel became a nation again after 2000 plus years of being in total disaster, being scattered all over the world, being forgotten as a nation, losing their Hebrew language, um, being you know, uh, murdered in the Holocaust of Nazi uh, you know, ovens. It was then the curse of the Jews of Ezekiel and the seven times prophecy. Suddenly the Jews, something happens where they're doing something and they're blessed. May 14th, 1948 was the first time uh, for over 2,000 years you actually see the Jews blessed in any way, shape, or form. This is amazing. Um, what happened in May 14th, 1940? Well, you know, after World War II and the Holocaust, the League of Nations, um, they voted, and it was actually the United States president who voted the final vote that, set, that was the deciding vote to let Israel become a nation and have their own homeland. Iran was really perturbed at the time. <laughs> um, and, and the Jews got their little UN plaque, you know, eventually and became part of that. That didn't work out in the long term though, but uh, that's a whole other story. Uh, but the Jews were celebrating. The British that were occupying Israel at that time left and left the Jews in charge of their own country. The British had been there a long time before that, the Ottoman Turks. Um, in fact, for thousands of years, the Jews were trounced and trampled in Jerusalem by the Romans, the Greeks, the Medes and the Persians, the Ottoman Turks and the Byzantine. Like we, we can talk about all the different people that came and trounced Jerusalem for 2000 years, but finally the Jews become a nation. Now, May 14th, May 15th, five Arab nations attacked 
Israel, the, the, the day two of their nation. Can you imagine that? Modern warfare. I mean, Jets and the, uh, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, they all attacked this one day old nation. And the Jews had no tanks. They didn't have any big fancy gear. The Jews had some pickup trucks and some pitchforks. And they fought against five of these modern Arab nations. And they, 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 they won. And they got this green little strip of land from the Arabs. And they even grew a little bit uh, and, and they, they became Israel uh, in May 14th, 1948 and defended themselves. But the one thing they didn't get in the war of independence there was Jerusalem. The Arabs still had Jerusalem, the Jordanians. The, the Jews only got that green strip of that map. And that was a glorious moment and Israel became a nation. But there was a section of Israel that was only nine miles wide. Um, like that's, that's pretty ra radical. Uh, the Jews, that, that's how it worked out for them. Well, you say, Brett, that's amazing. So the curse is lifted there? Well, yes, perhaps. But there's some interesting questions I still have about this whole prophecy. And, and what does it mean, this, this whole May 14th, 1948 and, and, and the curse and how it worked out? Uh, well, there's a couple things that we take away. Number one, um, the Bible is amazing. I think the Bible is amazing. Um, when, you, when you dig deep and you see, here's this little story of Ezekiel lying on his side and turning over and you think, what's that all about? Well, as it turns out, it's really pointing to and, and it declared something that we see actually that happened where God judged Israel for those 2,500 years. And the Bible is amazing in that at the very moment when the Lord said the curse will be up, suddenly they become a nation again after being scattered. No other nation in the history of the world has done that. That's amazing. The Bible is amazing. But secondly, it reminds me that the coming of the Lord is near. What do you mean about that, Brad? What does Israel have to do with that? Well, uh, just about everything. You see, the Bible tells us that when we start to see Israel and specifically Jerusalem flourish and do well, the coming of the Lord is near. There's a bunch of scriptures. Some of my favorites is uh, Psalm 102, verse 16 says, when the Lord shall build up Zion. Now the word Zion is another name for Jerusalem. But listen, specifically the temple mount in Jerusalem. Keep that tucked away for a second. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. When is the second coming of Christ? When Zion or Jerusalem is built up by the Lord back to some previous glory. Um, and by the way, this particular prophecy of Psalm 102, verse 16, has that really come to pass? The, the building up of the Temple Mount? Not really, not yet. But Brett, the Jews became a nation in 1940. Yeah, that's the building up of Israel and the blossoming of Israel. We're seeing it start to flourish and no longer in a curse and it's become one of the most powerful nations in the world. But have we seen Zion come to its fullness? Not yet. But Interestingly, Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter, chapter 24. Remember in Matthew 24, they came, the disciples, and said, Jesus, tell us about the end of the world. And Jesus went on that, what we call the Olivet Discourse. That is the, the sermon that he gave on the Mount of Olives about the last days or the end times. And Jesus said, well, this is what's gonna happen. In the last days, you'll see wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in diverse places. There'll be many false Christs that will come in my name. But these things are the beginning of sorrows. They're not the, the full extent. You know, uh, Jesus says, you know, hang on, because this is just getting things up and running. But eventually is gonna come the very end. And then he talks about the more of the last days kind of events, Matthew 24. But in that dissertation about the, the last days, he says something that's really interesting. He says in Matthew 24, 32, right here, he says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Uh, now pause for a second. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. It's a national symbol. Um, there's several places in the Bible that talks about the fig tree as being a type or a symbol of Israel. So Jesus says, learn the parable of the fig tree when his branch is yet tender and puts forth his leaves you know that summer is near. So likewise, when you shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus is giving us a hint here about the end times, the last days. 
And he says, the generation that sees the fig tree blossom, what an appropriate topic of today as trees around Portland are blossoming in spring. And it gives us hope, especially us in Portland, of the gray days of winter are gone and summer's on its way. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's the way Jesus is saying. When you see Israel blossom, the fig tree, know this, that the summer is near and these things are, are coming at the very door. So the question then becomes, are, have you and I seen the fig tree blossom? Um, I'm tempted to say, well, yes, for sure. You might even say May 14th, 1948. There's people in this room that were alive when that happened. Um, now, now, some of you are like, yeah, but Brett, that generation is well, it's getting up there. I mean, we're not trying to kick out the door or anything, but, but uh, those that lived in 1948, that's a, that's a smaller group. That generation, is that the generation that will not pass before the end comes? Well, I don't know, it's possible. I, that's one of the reasons why I believe it, it's very possible that even in our lifetime, that, that Christ could return. The rapture of the church, the second coming of Christ after the tribulation. I think that could happen in our lifetime easily. And it would make sense that that's when Israel blossomed. So it makes me excited because we are privileged as Christians to be living in a day where it very could be the possibility that you and I uh, are living in the last days. We're gonna see this stuff come to pass. Um, now you say, but Brett, what if that isn't the generation? What if there's something else? Well, there is another event that happened in Israel. Um, there's, there's famous dates in modern Israel that are kind of important, but probably the biggest one might just be May 14th, 1948, when they became a nation. That might be the biggest one but there might be one that's even more important, especially as it, as it relates to biblically. But if you ask Jews in Jerusalem, what's the most important date? They may not say May 14th, 1948. There's a different date. But before I tell you what that is, um, let's use a little different um, perhaps model of numbers. Uh, let's go back to our math. I know you're gonna need Advil by the end of the service. Um, but I got a few math items for you here. Again, let's go back. Um, now. You remember that we, we based our last, uh, you know, um, servitude of the nations, as it's called, the, the formula we used starting in 605 when the first captives went off into Jerusalem. I think that's interesting that it brought us to May 14th, 1948. That's interesting. But as it turns out, the temple was finally destroyed and burned and the last, uh, the last of the uh, captives were taken, the very last ones, including, by the way, Jeremiah, remember when Jeremiah was part of that? The, the Bible tells us exactly what happened. Jeremiah was like the last guy and he was chained up with uh, Nebuzar Adon. Remember that guy? And Nebuchadnezzar told his Nebuzar Adon, hey, uh, Jeremiah the prophet, let him go. And so they unchained him and said, you can either come to Babylon or you can stay, whatever you wanna do. And Jeremiah said, I'm staying. But that last group of people, that happened on the month of Av, uh, again, the Jewish calendar, um, uh, of 9th, 586 BC. I remember 586 is that most famous date of when Jerusalem was also finally completely destroyed and the city was burned. Of 9th, 586. Six was the completion of that. So if you start to apply um, after the, the, you know, if you take it from that date, the 70 years of captivity, it brings you to August 6th, on, back to our calendar, uh, 517 BC. If you go from August 16th, 517 BC, and you add those 907,200 days, it brings you to the most interesting date of, of this, June 7th, 1967. What is that date? My birthday. True, it's my birthday. Mildred, we, we've joined a cult. Let's get out of, let's get out of here. Uh, no, no, my birthday is not the important part. What happened, what happened on June 7th, 1967? Israel finally takes Jerusalem and the Temple Mount and a little thing called the Six Day War. The Jews to this day put that right up there with May 14th, 1948 as the date. And it's maybe more important because it's all about Jerusalem. And more importantly, it's all about the Temple Mount in Jerusalem where the former Temple of Solomon was. Now, now this, this is where you kind of go, the Bible is really amazing. Because no matter how you shake this out with the curse, the seven times curse and Ezekiel's lying on his side, 
both dates bring you to the two most important dates in modern Israel history. Now, by the way, for you that are a little bit timid about like, we're gonna study the book of Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel's a challenging book, but one of the things I love about Ezekiel, unlike some of the other books of prophecy in the Bible, is a lot of the things Ezekiel talks about ends up happening in our day, modern day right now. Even the book of Revelation is talking about a day where we're not even gonna be here, in my opinion, uh, the tribulation period. Re Revelation six through 19 is all about the seven year period called the tribulation. Um, if you read the book of Daniel, great prophecy, but it's all about the Jews and Israel and their future. Um, so much of the Bible prophecy deals with the Jews or with the, uh, the tribulation period, but what about the present day and the church age and the, before the rapture and before the, the tribulation and all that stuff? Where's the prophecy about that? Ezekiel turns out, he's the one who talks more about our time than any of the other prophets. And isn't it fascinating that Ezekiel gets us to these, you know, May 14th, 1948, and it gets us to 1967 when the Jews actually take the Temple Mount. By the way, this taking of the Temple Mount was an amazing story. The Arab nations were posturing themselves um, to uh, overtake the Jews in the little sliver of land that they had from 1948. So the Jews um, proactively, um, or preemptively, I should say, did a big strike against those Arab nations and they prevailed. This time they were more ready than they were in 1948. They had jets and modern warfare. And in six days, the Jews defended themselves, wiped out those Arab nations that were threatening to, to kill them and drive them into the sea. And they, they, they ended up going into Jerusalem and they took Jerusalem. These soldiers literally uh, took Jerusalem soldier by soldier. They went up to Jerusalem and, um, and, and you can hear audio recordings of their, their radio uh, broadcasts or their you know, communications where they were, you know, you'd hear their guns, da, 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 and then they'd be talking, but they'd also be weeping because they couldn't believe they were actually touching the stones of the, of the Western Wall and that they were standing on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem that had been trodden down under the Gentiles for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the Jews are like, we finally have Jerusalem once again. Um, I've taken our tour groups through this very gate that they're running through right there. I've walked through there with our teams and, and this is you know, them taking the Temple Mount, running up there. This is literal footage of, of Bible prophecy being fulfilled in kind of a profound thing. This guy with the patch, Moshe Dayan. He was the general who led the forces into Jerusalem, taking Jerusalem in 1967. Um, now, by the way, do you remember when President uh, Obama was the president, and he said, we need to return Jerusalem or Israel back to the 1967, pre-1967 borders. I hope you understand, that's him, our president saying, they need to give up Jerusalem back to the Arabs. That's kind of an interesting thing. Most people didn't know what pre-1967 meant. But as it turns out, Moshe Dayan, this, this picture was most famous for you older folks in here. You might maybe remember this picture because it was a big deal. Because here's this Jewish guy with a patch, with a firearm on his side, walking in like John Wayne into Jerusalem. And he took over the temple and the temple mount and did it quite handily. And the Jews were celebrating uh, because they got Jerusalem back. They were flourishing once again, being blessed out of their minds once again. They were no longer under those cursed years. Now they're being blessed. But Moshe Dayan did something that was really peculiar. He unilaterally made a decision as the general that took Jerusalem. He then said, listen, Arab nations, we just trounced you, we destroyed you, and you better behave. But as an act of good faith and good gesture, Moshe Dayan said, we're gonna give back to you the Temple Mount. The Jews freaked out. What are you doing? We just shed our blood and, and got the Temple Mount back and you're giving it back to, to the Jordanians and the Muslims. But Moshe, Moshe Dayan did that. And to this day, you wonder, in fact, I was in Jerusalem a few years back um, and I was in a little store and this, this little old guy was in there with his things he was selling and he had little ancient coins and some fire, uh, you know, some uh, lamps from the first century and stuff. But I, I said, how long have you lived in Jerusalem? And he said, I have lived here since June 7th, 1967. And he said, I was one of the soldiers who came and took this Temple Mount and took this back to Jerusalem. And I, I thought, wow, this is one of the guys. 
And I was thinking this was cool. And I said, I said, I have a question for you. I said, why did Moshe Diane give the Temple Mount back to the Arabs? And suddenly he got visibly angry and he reached down to his pant leg and he pulled up his pant leg and he showed me his leg and it was this horrible scar on his leg, a brutal scar. And he said, I got this scar taking the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and Moshe Dayan gave it back to the Arabs. He was like furious. I'm like, uh, calm down, Shalom. You know, like, <laughs> come on now, uh, calm down. He got like visibly angry. He was upset. And he's, he was furious years later uh, saying that Moshe Dayan gave the whole, see, the reason he was so upset and, and rightly so is you know, the, the Temple Mount is the first most holy site in all of Judaism. For the Muslim, interestingly enough, it's the third most holy site. Uh, Mecca, number one, Medina, number two, and then the, the Muslims. Now, when did it become the third most holy site of all of Islam, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? <laughs> in recent history. It was Yasser Arafat. Do you guys remember Yasser Arafat, the older folks in here? It was his great uncle, the Grand Mufti, who declared the Temple Mount as where you know, Muhammad would have ascended and all that. And so suddenly the Muslims in recent history said, oh yeah, uh, it's a holy site for us, the, the Temple Mount. Today, if you go to the Temple Mount, the Muslims on the Temple Mount will tell you the Jews were never here. There was never a temple on the Temple Mount. That's what they'll tell you. Um, it's all propaganda. And the Muslims have a thing in their religion that says once you occupy a land, the Muslim law says you have to have that land. And if anybody tries to take it, you at all costs get that land back. Like that's Islamic rule. So the Temple Mount is held to this very day because of Moshe Dan's unilateral action to give away the Temple Mount back. Even though they conquered it, took it, he gave it to the Muslims and the Muslims, Muslims are there to this day. So that when I bring tour groups to Israel, we go up to the Temple Mount, at least we try. I think it was our last group we were forbidden to go because of, it was unsafe. There, were, there was bombs coming into Israel on our last trip. We were sipping tea on the Red Sea, having a great time, but there were bombs. And so they said, you guys shouldn't go up to the Temple Mount. One of our groups a, a few years ago uh, was on the Temple Mount. We were quietly, they won't let you carry a Bible on the Temple Mount. You can't talk about Jesus or the temple. They'll, they'll, they'll kick you right off of there. So when we go to the Temple Mount, we kind of quietly walk and we kind of get in a little group and talk about what's going on on the Temple Mount, show where the former temple was and stuff like that. Um, but one of the times, a few times ago, we were up there and they could tell we were talking about the Jewish temple. And so all the Muslim clerics and uh, clergy and all that, they all came circling around us. And then they started yelling, Allah, Akbar, Allah, Akbar, Allah. And then it, got, it started to be kind of a, a little bit of a, a scary moment. How many of you guys, anybody here that was on that trip with me uh, that was in that? Oh, so the 10 o'clock, there's none of them. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> they were all at the last service, I think. Um, but it was, a little, it was a little sketchy, I'll just admit it. And we're like, okay, nice little visit to the Temple Mount, we're out of here, pure, because it was getting kind of riled up. Why? Because the Muslims control the Temple Mount. You say, okay, Brett, so I'm confused. The curse seems to be, have, have been lifted off of the Jews, May 14th, 1948 might be, or, or even June 7th, 1960, I'll take either date, they both work. But those are both dates where Israel started to flourish. But as it turns out, Jerusalem is still being trodden down under the foot of Gentiles. Why do I use that language? Well, Israel, again, remember, Israel is God's timepiece when it comes to Bible prophecy. And, and really specifically Jerusalem. If you wanna know Bible prophecy and what's gonna happen, you gotta really look at Israel. That's a, the epicenter of everything Bible prophecy. You have to understand that. But specifically Jerusalem, now check this out. It says in Luke 21, Jesus was saying this, talking about the last days and the end times. Luke 21, 24, um, Jesus said concerning the Jews, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now this gets interesting. When is Jerusalem gonna cease from being trodden down under the feet of Gentiles? When the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. What's the time of the Gentiles? Well, if you would, there's times of the Jews and the times of the Gentiles in the Bible. The times of the Jews started you know, with Abraham. 
and went from Abraham and through all the, you know, eventually the wilderness wanderings and Moses and Joshua. And there were times where God was working in and through the Jewish people and, and almost uh, uh, only the Jews really for the most part. But when did the Jews cease from being, you know, really, um, you know, the, the one God was working in and through? You might just say it was when they went off to Babylon because really from that day forward, they were under that punishment and that, that sort of the curse from the, the 70 years of Babylon all the way till 1948 at least, maybe to 1967. But, but what's happening? You and I, in our lifetime, in my lifetime, we're witnessing the blossoming of Israel, the, the flourishing of the Jews. They're one of the most powerful, successful nations in the world today fulfilling Bible prophecy. And later on in Ezekiel, we're gonna see even more imagery of that, the, the valley of dry bones, and there's all these skeletons, and pretty soon the bones start clinking together, and Ezekiel sees this, and pretty soon flesh gets on the bone, and then pretty soon life is breathed. And, and it's, it's a, a picture of God reviving the Jewish people and the Jewish nation. Right now, I think you and I are seeing the bones come together and life uh, well, at least skin, and, 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 and we're seeing the evidence that God's doing a work. But has he breathed life into the Jews yet? Not, don't think so. When's that gonna happen? When the fullness of the Gentiles come in. You see, when Jesus, you know, uh, rose from the grave uh, and ascended into heaven, the church started to happen, the church age, you might call it. And as it turns out, largely the Jews rejected Jesus, the Messiah. Remember when Paul the apostle, who was a Jew of Jews, he said, I want to minister to the Jews. And he'd always say, Lord, I wanna go talk to the Jews. And the Lord said, no, you're, you're gonna be the minister to the Gentiles. And Paul said, no, I wanna to minister to the Jews. And remember, every time he'd go minister to the Jews, they hated him and wanted to kill him. But every time he'd go minister to the Gentiles, um, repent and be saved, and the Gentiles, we, what, what must we do to be saved? And, and thousands of Gentiles came to the Lord through Paul's ministry. And then he'd go back to the Jews. Hey, Jesus is Messiah, we're gonna kill you. What was going on with that? Well, it's the time of the Gentiles. This, this age we live in right now, it is largely the Gentiles who believe in the true and living God. If you go to Tel Aviv today, more than 70% of the Jews living in Tel Aviv are atheists. Why is it that it's the time of Gentiles? Now, by the way, um, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a, a commentary from God through Paul the Apostle about his plan for the Jews and the plan for the Gentiles. Um, you should read that because a lot of the church is ignorant about this, I have to say. Um, there's a lot of denominations and churches that say, yeah, we don't talk about Jews. We don't care about the Jews because they murdered Jesus. And the Jews, they lost their chance. They once were God's chosen people. But what they believe is the church has replaced the Jew as God's chosen people. It's called replacement theology, totally off the rails. God still loves the Jews. God still has a plan for the Jews. And if he forsakes the Jews, why wouldn't he forsake you? Um, it's, a, it's a real bad theology to, to say God's done with the Jews. But what does the Bible actually say? Well, check this out, Romans, I told you Romans 9, 10, 11 is the commentary, but he, he sums it up right here in Romans eleven twenty five 25 through 27. Um, he says, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Don't be dumb on this. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits. What's happened? Largely, the, the Gentile church, we're, we're wise in our conceits saying, God loves us, but he's done with the Jew. Uh, the whole Catholic church believes in replacement theology. Uh, much of the Presbyterian church believes in replacement theology. It's the, uh, the Gentiles are the ones God cares about. It's totally wrong. Um, he says, lest you be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. And what will he do? He shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. God has a covenant with the Jews and it's an everlasting covenant. In a sense, you could say the Jewish plan was put on hold and God blinded the Jews for a season, for a long season. And it's all part of that curse 
of the Ezekiel on the side and the seven times curse, and they've been cursed. But it's in our lifetime we start to see Israel now out of that curse, starting to blossom, starting to come back to life as a nation and as a people, but there's not life breathed into them. When will that happen? When the Gentiles are all done. When the fullness of the Gentiles. What is it that's gonna be the fullness of the Gentiles? I believe there's a couple things that we can sort of define that. Could there be a, a threshold of a time where the Lord's looking at the earth and it's the season of the Gentiles and many, many Gentiles like you and me, um, we've accepted Christ, but is there gonna come a time where the Lord knows and he knows all things, where he says, that is the fullness of the Gentiles. That last Gentile that gets saved or becomes a believer, that last one, that's the one that's gonna be the end of the Gentiles. I wonder sometimes, will that be on a Sunday when I'm sharing the gospel here and some person raises their hand and all of a sudden, boom, we're raptured. <laughs> end of the Gentiles, could be, probably not, but it could be. Uh, I, I, the fullness of the Gentiles is when, when the Lord says I, that season of the Gentiles is over and the rapture of the church. Well, Brett, does the Bible give us the day or the hour for that? Well, this is where you have to be careful, Christians, because there are pastors and weirdos that have come along over the years and said, well, I know the day when the rapture's gonna happen. And you say, well, Brett, they, you can track the day of the Jesus riding into Palm Sunday. You can even track the day of the six day war or even Israel becoming a nation. Why wouldn't we be able to track, tra track the rapture of the church? Easy answer on that one. The Lord says in his Bible, no man knows the day nor the hour of the rapture of the church or the second coming of Christ. We don't know that. And the Bible says you won't know that. It's a variable. So, so don't let, if you hear somebody saying the rapture of the church or the end of the world is on June 7th or whatever, uh, tell them you, they've been drinking their bath water because that's what they've been doing. <laughs> totally wrong. But there is a season the Bible talks about, uh, the fullness of the Gentiles. When that happens, I believe that's when the rapture of the church is gonna happen. And the Gentile church will be taken out of the world and suddenly it's all about the Jews again. Again, for you Bible scholars and students, Daniel 70 weeks, the first 69 weeks have already happened. There's a 70th week or seven year period, remember, that is set aside and it says, Daniel 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. Not on the church, on the Jews, Daniel's people. And that 70th week, the seven year period that's left is called the tribulation. And it's determined for the Jews, not for the church. If the church and the Gentiles weren't in the first 70 weeks of Daniel, why would we be, or first 69 weeks, why would we be in the, six, the 70th week of Daniel? Um, the people that say the church is gonna go through the tribulation, I don't agree with that. But all that to say, th this is what the Bible says, the Jews, what's gonna happen when the fullness of the Gentiles come in, we get taken up to be with the Lord and then suddenly it's all about Israel again. And it says during that time, Israel will turn away from ungodliness and all of Israel shall be saved and they'll be taken, their sins will be taken away. That's the plan of God. So the reason this is important is we see Jerusalem still being trodden down under the Gentiles. Um, that's what's happening right now. That's why the Muslims still have the Temple Mount. It'll be during that seven year period where uh, there'll be a, a unholy sort of treaty made that's, uh, I get off course when I talk about this, but they're gonna build the temple again someday on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and the Jews will have it again. But that's not gonna be, that's gonna be at the tribulation period. But the point that I make is all of this gives you and me, Christians living in 2021, the sense that we very well could be the last of the Gentiles, um, the last generation. Uh, that has seen the fig tree blossom, that has seen Jerusalem, the city taken by the Jews. But right now, the Temple Mount, it's like they took the nation, but they didn't get Jerusalem. Then in 67, they took the city of Jerusalem, but they didn't get the Temple Mount because they gave it back. There's coming a time where they're gonna get the Temple Mount back and that's gonna be in the tribulation period. You see, you and I are living right on the cusp of those things. And, and so, um, so what do we do with that? What should we do with the knowledge of this? Brett, you've been talking numbers and dates and showing us some stuff, um, kind of interesting. Uh, are they just coincidences? Well, I don't believe those dates are coincidences. Those are god -oinces. But um, But what does the Bible say? Um, you know, some of you might be saying, Brett, you've been talking about this for years. Yeah, I've been doing prophecy updates for, 
uh, 25 plus years. I even did them before we had this church. But the, the point is, um, some people are scoffing. I always love it when people scoff. Brett, you think you're living in the last times. Pastors have thought that for, for generations. Um, I say, this is awesome. Why? Well, let me read to you from, uh, you know, uh, for Second Peter. Uh, this is one of my favorite things when people start scoffing. It says this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Know this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. <laughs> so when people say stuff to me, I say, hey, you're fulfilling Bible prophecy. <laughs> they'll be scoffers and they'll say, they'll be walking after their own lust saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. And then he talks about the flood of Noah and how God you know, judged the world with a flood. But then he says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, are reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Here, here Peter says, you can scoff if you want, but God's gonna come and judge this world. And it's not gonna be with a flood, it's gonna be with fire. But he says, beloved, talking to the church, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. In other words, you know, in God's economy, Christ said 2,000 years ago, I'm gonna ascend into heaven and I go to prepare a place for you. You say, that was 2,000 years ago, but a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. That's just a couple days for Jesus. He's been gone a couple days. And then it says, and the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, in other words, he's not lazy. Where's the Lord? Where's the promise of his coming? Lord is not slack, but here's why it says, but he is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, the time of the Gentiles, do you ever get a sense that we're on borrowed time right now? It's like you see the world and you think what's going on and you, know, you just go, man, there's so much evil in the world. And, and you even hear the worldling say, if God is love, why doesn't he intervene and step in and deal with evil? Be careful what you ask for, because that is gonna happen. The Lord promises that he's gonna come and step in. It's called, there's a time period called the day of the Lord. When you read in the Bible this phrase, the day of the Lord, that's the time where the Lord says, that's it, time's up. And that, when that happens, that's the fullness of the Gentiles. That's the rapture of the church. And that's when God says, okay, I'm dealing with all the problems of the world. Do you wanna know what that looks like? He goes on in the, here in 2 Peter. He says this, listen. He says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away and with great noise and with the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And seeing all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be? In other words, here Peter's saying, yeah, um, I believe in global warming. That's what Peter said here. Did you hear that? Peter said the earth will melt and be dissolved with a fervent heat and burned up. It's not gonna be the 12 years of AOC. <laughs> it's gonna be the 12 milliseconds of whatever the Lord just says, uh, it's over. And it's gonna melt with a fervent heat. And so then he rhetorically says, because the earth's gonna be destroyed and the Lord's gonna judge and wrath and all that, what manner of persons should you be, he says. <laughs> and he answers his question. He says, we should be people of holy conversation, godliness, and here's what, we, here's what we're supposed to do. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, where the heavens will be on fire, the earth dissolved. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven, and a new earth where dwelleth all righteousness. You see, as the Christian, some of you, if you're not a Christian, you're saying, but this is kind of freaky stuff, prophecy and the earth melting and the end of all things. It's pretty much doom and gloom. No, it's not. If you're not a Christian, it's doom and gloom. I'm sorry. But if you're a Christian, it's boom and zoom. <laughs> boom, the earth blows up. You know, we get to be in heaven, zoom up and to be raptured into heaven and forever be with the Lord. So it says, what are we supposed to do? Live holy walk with the Lord and look for and hasten unto. It, hastening of the Lord means that we, we pray, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly and rapture your church. This is something we get to pray for. The early church had a, had a, a, a word they walked around saying, they said, Maranatha. Why did they say that? It meant, Lord, come quickly. The hastening of the Lord for his coming. Because the believer, it, it's gonna be the most glorious time when we get to be with the Lord for all eternity. 
And that's why you and I should be given to being holy, walking with the Lord, looking for the Lord's coming, preaching the gospel to all people because because the Lord is delaying, not because of laziness, but because he's being patient and he wants everyone to be saved. You and I have a job to do. We should be preaching the gospel as hard as we know how. Uh, We should be sharing the good news of the gospel with people because this is what's holding things up. The Lord's saying, I'm gonna be patient even though the world's going crazy. I'm gonna be patient before I pour out my wrath and judgment because he says, I would that none should perish, but everyone would come to repentance. That's the heart of God. So when I read prophecies like Ezekiel chapter four and see the the way the Lord dealt with the Jew and the Gentile age and the church age, his plan is coming to pass exactly to the very day it's coming to pass exactly like the Lord knew it would and said it would. The only variable we have is when is the end really gonna be? We don't know. But I think he did that on purpose so that you and I would live our lives holy, set aside for the Lord, looking for and waiting for his return. That's gonna be a glorious day, amen? Amen. 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 Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be a people that our hearts would be encouraged that you are coming, that you're gonna take us to be with you. But until then, I pray that we live our lives holy and walk blamelessly and and be lights in a dark world. I pray that you'd move solidly in your church and use us to share the good news of the gospel. I pray that more and more people would be baptized and discipled and and raised up in faith, Lord. I pray that we wouldn't take lightly the the glorious truth of your word, but but Lord, these prophecies only confirm the amazing, uh, miraculous nature of your word. So we're impressed, we're impressed by you, we're impressed by your word, and we worship your holy name. Lord, for the unsaved person, may they know their need for salvation. May they know that they're in their sins. May they know that they can be forgiven by accepting the work of the cross, believing in Jesus, that he died, that he rose from the grave, and that their sins are forgiven. Lord, may they they hear that and turn to you and be saved. Lord, we pray blessing now as we go our way Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's stand together. And before we head out, would, would we just join us as we just uh, think through those things and, and then we'll close with one song. Joey, lead us in one more song, buddy. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our from evil things Oh Lord we cast down our idols Give us clean hands Oh give us pure hearts Let us not lift our souls to another Won't you give us clean hands And give us pure hearts Lest us not lift our souls Give us pure Let us not lift our souls to another. Won't you give us clean hands? Oh, and give us pure Let us not lift our souls to another. Let us not lift our souls to another. Let us not lift our souls to you enough. So Lord, we do await your coming anxiously. We look to your word for just instruction on how to live the way that you'd have us live. So we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Hey, you guys are dismissed. Have an awesome Sunday. <laughs>